Well, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land, uh, the, the Tamuka people and the, the Seminole, and also to acknowledge the, uh, the living earth community in which we're embedded uh, here, the Sol Palmettos, the Live Oaks, the Northern Parallas uh, outside. And so my slide in between the data slides and the uh, sound slides, I'm going to be showing these photographs from the Sol Palmetto. I just snapped these this morning, uh, just to honor our green cousins around us uh, here as well, just to give your, uh, uh, your botanical imagination, a little room to, to roam. And I want to thank the World Forum for Acoustic Ecology, the planning committee, especially in the production team. Extraordinary amount of, of work went into producing this fruitful, extraordinary gathering at the Atlantic Center for the Arts and Stetson University. My own studies of sounds began with a PhD on the acoustics of young wood warblers here in North America using field recordings and, and playback experiments. But I really started to listen by listening in community rather than just listening solo with my you know, microphone pointing at the birds. And I want to acknowledge and thank three, three different types of community. Uh, that have helped me in my own path. The first is the community of students. I've been teaching at the University of the South for 25 years now and have one way or another found excuses to get students outside uh, listening to the, uh, to the world around them and within them, whether that's in the science classroom or creative writing classes uh, that, I, that I now teach. And being able to share the curiosity, the fascination, the heartbreak of, live, of listening listening in the world with, with students has really been an extraordinary experience and privilege for me. So I want to acknowledge that and offer them my thanks. Uh, another practice that I've had for quite a few years now is sitting uh, in silence with particular individual trees and particular patches of forest. If you want a really exciting read, my first book is about one square meter of forest. So I sat and watched a pile of dead leaves for an entire year. It's just thrilling. Some of the leaves decomposed a little bit. Actually, you know, pay attention in any moment in one square meter of forest, there's more going on than you could capture in an entire lifetime of attention. So I want to acknowledge and thank uh, my sister brothers, the, uh, the trees for their teachings over the years. And my partner, Katie Lehman, who is uh, a musician, uh, an arts creator, has opened my ears both in, in the human musical world and beyond and, and really transformed my listening, uh, uh, transformative guide and, and companion. So thank you to all. My book sounds wild and broken that you now have to weigh down your hand baggage. Uh, you can throw it out when the ballast gets, gets too much and leave it for, for someone else to discover. Uh, it's intended for a general audience. Uh, in the book, the book is partly a celebration of the Earth's acoustic sonic history, the creative processes that gave rise to the present day diversity that we experience. But I hope it's also an invitation uh, to listen, to be curious, to understand sound's richness and the crises that we live among, the crisis of inattention, of silencing, of noise, of injustice, both within the human community, but also between the human uh, species and other species uh, on, on our planet. And I'll add that in, in the context of this book, if any of you are teachers and use this or any of my other writings with your students, I am more than happy to Zoom or Skype in for a Q and A, a little dialogue, including some critique of my work. I, I, you know, I actually enjoy hearing students who think, well, that was a load of BS and I'm gonna tell, tell you why. So please don't hesitate to reach out. And no, uh, that's it's a very re meaningful thing for me to be in conversation with students around the world uh, around, around these questions. So today I'm not going to give an overview of the book, but rather pick out and place into conversation uh, some, some parts of the book that I think address some of the themes of the conference, li uh, listening past, and listening futures, and hopefully offer a few interesting generative nuggets uh, for you to take away uh, for your own thinking and work. And in particular, I'm going to ask how beginnings of sound, and I have, if, if, if I don't run over on the first uh, few examples, I think I have about four examples of beginnings of sound, um, how thinking about beginnings might expand our listening in the present and perhaps out into the future. So sound, of course, is ephemeral. 
and yet sounds from the past have left clues to their natures to, and to the causes and the relationships and the stories that gave rise to them. So let's start with a discussion of past communicative sounds within the living world. Sounds whose evolutionary intent is to signal from one creature to another. And these communicative sounds, of course, are different in their, in their origins and in their intent and in their evolutionary story than incidental sounds. When I chew my breakfast sitting in a room by myself or even with others, the chewing sounds are not generally intended to be communicative, although one can be a passive aggressive chewer. <laughs> Or when a fish is paddling through, through the water or, or uh, a crab scuttling across uh, the, the sand, that is making, it's a sound making being and those sounds are important in many ways, but they're generally not a, a communicative sound. So here I'm gonna focus on, on communicative sounds. And shockingly, it turns out for, for about nine tenths of Earth's history and life's history, as far as we can tell, there were no communicative sounds on this planet. So we're a very weird species here. You know, I'm standing here making all sorts of communicative gestures and, and hopefully they're communicating something. Gestures and uh, uh, vibratory sounds down in my throat that, that emerge out of, out of the mouth and we're surrounded by other uh, vocal creatures that do the same. And yet that's, that's weird in terms of the whole arc of Earth's history. Bacteria and single-celled creatures, of course, it dominated Earth history for the first billion years, maybe a couple of billion years on planet. On our planet, they evolved about three and a half billion years ago. Every bacterial cell is a little ear, and I'm using quotes around the term ear. What do I mean by that? Well, they're covered in res little receptors that detect shear and stretch and deformation and, and vibration. So they are picking up particle motions and pressure waves around them. Of course, not every single pressure wave or particle motion, they have a, a particular range of frequency that, that, that each one of those molecular structures is, is tuned to. But the, the sounds are sensitive to, excuse me, the cells are sensitive to sound. These creatures also emit sound. In, today, you can measure it with very sensitive microphones or with uh, atomic force microscope cantilevers. Uh, and, and presumably the cells from three billion years ago were also emitting these sounds. Here's an example of that. Uh, here's a, a, a paper from the, from the late nineties, in fact. In fact, I've only been able to find about 10 papers that have even asked the question, do bacterial cells make sound? So what I'm saying here is very preliminary. Any of you who are micro, right, microbially inclined and want to listen in on, on, on the bacteria microbial world, I think there's a lot to be learned there. But here is the, the graph behind me is the, uh, the um, intensity, signal intensity against frequency. And of course, human hearing is way over there on the, on the, the left-hand side, particularly my hearing, way over on the left. Uh, and, and they're emitting sounds all over, all up into what we would call the ultrasonic range. But notice there's quite a big spike at, at, at the low frequencies. So what I've done is, 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 it's not actually from this, it's from this graph, but it's not from the microphones they used. I've recreated this sound, which is essentially, uh, broad spectrum noise with some frequencies a, a little more vigorous than others. So here we're going to listen in on um, some bacillus. So uh, Fascinating sound, a sort of thing where one maybe could mark it with an app as the, let the microbial world put you to sleep instead of the white noise. Uh, apps also sounds a little bit like the roar of the, of the, of the Atlantic seashore uh, here or the roar of the, uh, uh, the waves uh, that we heard about earlier in this room in, in Japan. So there's an interesting convergence there. Uh, but bacteria are also sensitive to sound, and it turns out that their growth rate differs if you play back this sort of sound, they grow faster than without it. So not only are they making sound, they are responding to it perhaps as a form of eavesdropping. But to this day, there is no example that I know of of a bacterium singing or making a commun communicative sound. The same is true for protists, single cell creatures like yeast and amoeba. No yeast that we know of sings to its mate. No amoeba shouts out uh, sounds of warning. 
Again, big caveat, nobody has really looked that carefully for those. But in a way that makes sense because these are creatures that are living within nanometers of one another. And so chemical communication is probably more precise, fast and nuanced. And chemical communication also translates directly into the language of the interior of the cell, which is mostly about chemical communication as well. Now this communicates into the early parts of animal evolution. Uh, for the first several hundred million years of the evolution of complex animals, there is no evidence whatsoever of any communicative sound. Yet, it may be that some paleontologist uncovers a, a singing trilobite next uh, year and publishes it in Nature, and it will be, a, it'll be I think, a, an extraordinary discovery. Uh, because it seems that the early oceans and the early terrestrial world did not have the kinds of sounds that we now uh, are surrounded by, both in the, in the terrestrial realm, but also out in the oceans. How do we know this? Well, there's no fossil evidence of any stridulatory device, percussive device, popping device of the kind that you find on insect wings and parts of the exoskeletons of crabs and so on, you know, 100 million years ago in the fossil record, but not 500 million years ago. So the fossil record doesn't reveal everything about sound, of course, but it does leave a record of what the, the, the structures of, the, of these creatures were. And there, there, so far, there are no sound making devices discovered. We can also look indirectly by reconstructing the evolutionary tree of different organisms and asking, when did this singing group of creatures first evolved using DNA to, to calibrate that uh, evolutionary clock? And for example, most species of fish that we now know sing and make all sorts of cool sounds out in freshwater and in the oceans evolved, their families evolved mostly around 100 million years ago, not 500 or 400 million years ago. One exception to that, that the sturgeon, uh, ancient group of fish that do make sounds and may have made sounds a long, long time ago. So why this long communicative silence? Well, all the animals evolved with the ability to detect sound around them, at least low frequency sounds, either through pressure waves or particle motion. Why is that? Because they have ciliary hairs on their body or internal ears within, uh, or uh, statuses and other things within their body that allow them to detect how their body is moving within the environment. So motion and sound proprioception and sound detection are closely linked. And so for a creature to start making sound in an ocean full of animals that have hearing ability pre-installed is not a good idea. And this isn't a story just from long ago. Think about today. Worms do not sing, but snapping shrimp do. Snapping shrimp are well defended and they can get away from predators quickly. Frogs, very vocal. They have powerful jumping hind legs. They can get away from predators. Salamanders, silent. And so if we look at the creatures that actually comprise the communicative dimension of most soundscapes, both above the water and below the water, it tends to be fierce and fast creatures. Uh, so maybe in, in the present day, we, we see uh, some of that. And I'd recommend the uh, Christine and Ben's secret reception in, in the upstairs from where we get our lunch and so on, extraordinary exploration of the diversity of cilia and uh, hearing within the insects. I point out that with underneath that diversity, there's also unity. Every single animal on this planet is using the same cellular structure at root to hear, and that is the cilium, the little hairy extension out of the, out of the cell surface. Extraordinary that evolution has taken that single structure and, and changed it into organs in the legs of insects and in the inner ears of vertebrates and, and on the surfaces of fish. So uh, extraordinary uh, late development of sonic communication compared to visual and chemical communication in the oceans. The, uh, most of the dominant sound makers evolved just in the last hundred million years, the snapping shrimp and fish, there are a few exceptions, sturgeon being among them. On the land, here is the first physical evidence we have of a communicative sound making device. I'm going to try and X out of zoom. So you can see it. Uh, so this is a study by Olivier Betou and his colleagues at National History Museum in, in Paris. This is a fossil from the Lodev in uh, southern France. Uh, here's the fossil at the, at the lower part of the slide above it. You can see a sketch of the veins 
on this insect wing. The insect was cricket-like. It's not technically a modern cricket, but it was something like the crickets. And you can see here over where they've labeled SA, there is a place where the, the veins converge and are raised into a ridge with lots of little nubs along it. They interpret that as a stridulatory device. In other words, a device that when it's scraped against the body or the other wing, it makes a little chirping sound. If we zoom in, we can see here is a stridulatory device uh, uh, drawn out. It's, it's not as evenly spaced uh, as those, and it has fewer teeth within it as say modern crickets or katydids, but nonetheless, it, it would have made a sound. And what I did was take the measurements of the spacing of all these little nubs and the length of the, uh, of the stridulatory file here and compare it to modern katydids and crickets to try and back calculate what this might have sounded like. And I'll play this sound and I should emphasize this is speculative. We do not know how fast this creature rubbed its wings, exactly how it did it. So this is sort of in the realm of speculative. Um, Fabulations, as Donna Haraway would say. Uh, so this is a little chorus of them, some of different size than others. Okay, so so they they got their groove on back then. This is about two hundred seventy-five million years ago, and know that it happens. They're still going. Um, in fact, they are still going two hundred seventy-five million years later. This evolved very soon after the first insect wings evolved. So 275 million years ago for this, insect wings probably evolved about 300 million years ago. Insect wings are amazing sound makers. Why? They're papery surfaces attached to vibratory muscles, just like a loudspeaker now, right? Which has a paper cone and then the vibratory, not a muscle, but a little electronic device. Wings also, of course, allow rapid escape. So the evolution of insect wings unlocked song in the terrestrial realm, both because of their physical properties and also because ecologically they reduced the cost of, of sound making from predation. It turns out just in the last couple of years, more discoveries uh, have been made from other groups. These are grasshopper like uh, creatures that may have used crepitation as far as 300 million years ago. These are the kind of sounds crepitation is the craftily sound that grasshoppers make when they fly off. So that's another potential communicative sound maker from, uh, from the Permian. Uh, here's another example uh, just published, if I remember, um, last year. Uh, this is from the, uh, uh, the wing cover of, so the first set of, of wings of a, a hemipteran, very distant relative to the cicadas and, and the tree hoppers. And you can see again, these lines on it are stridulatory, very much like uh, modern insects you use to rub their wings to make these sounds. So after they evolved wings, insects then filled the world, or at least uh, variegated the world, with all sorts of fascinating, croaky, raspy sounds. At this time, vertebrates are probably at best making just a few wheezy sounds uh, out of their throats. The, the, the soundscapes of the first few, of the first hundred million years of animal evolution on land after insect wings evolved were dominated by, uh, by the insects. So what is the significance of this for listening today? Well, the first thing I think is that when we go outside and listen to insect choruses, we, are, we have a direct connection to sensory connection to some of the earliest soundscapes on the planet. Of course, the insects in the Jurassic and the Triassic and the Permian had different tunings and, and things like that. But some of the reconstructions, the recent reconstructions, particularly from the Jurassic, sound very much like modern crickets. So we, it's, it's very rare to have that direct sensory connection to the past. You can look at a fossil, but it's you know brown and crumbly. You don't really feel the creature. And of course, in the movies, the recreation of Jurassic Park and so on, the sounds in there are all, um, of course, completely imaginative, have very little to do with the actual anatomy of, of uh, dinosaur vocalizations. But an insect chorus, and I'd say here in the Southern US, in, in the late summer, the insect choruses are extraordinary. They'll make your chest vibrate with the amount of uh, sound coming from them, takes us back into deep time. The other thing is that vertebrate animals then evolved in the context of insect sound. So the insects definitely came first, and the, the vocalization and the hearing ability of, of 
uh, the reptiles that then evolved into birds and, and, and mammals and some continuing on as so-called reptiles. Uh, it was contingent on what the, the sounds that the insects had made. Why is that important? The first vertebrates that come onto land had hearing adapted to, to the ocean. On land, they could only hear low frequency sounds and mostly by resting their lower jaw on the ground or their forelimbs so that bone conduction would transmit those low frequency sounds into their fishy inner ears. And only later did they evolve lengthened cochlea and um, tympanic membranes and middle ear bones and things that allowed them to hear in air and to hear high frequency sounds. Why would they want to hear high frequency sounds? Because there are all these little protein snacks around them making sound and advertising where they were. So again, this we, we can't know this for sure, but it seems to me, ecologically, it seems very likely that vertebrate hearing extended up into the higher registers as a way of, of tuning into the insect sounds. And then of course, once their hearing goes up, then that creates a possibility for vocal communication at the top of the larynx. And even the fish had a little valve up at the top of the larynx, so fairly easy to modify into, into sound making device. Uh, so um, Chungpeng Shu la last year and uh, his colleagues actually went further and suggested that mammals specifically co-evolved our uh, hearing with katydids uh, back in the in the Mesozoic. So that he, their, their hypothesis is of a very specific kind of co-evolution. So in other words, historical contingency is really important in the evolution of soundscapes. Two other examples of historical contingency. First, the evolution of flowering plants. We don't think about flowers as being particularly relevant to soundscapes, except in a very indirect way. But if you trace the evolutionary tree of almost every single major sound producing organism in the terrestrial world today now, when the flowering plants, the angiosperms evolved, those evolutionary trees exploded in diversity because flowering plants started engaging in all sorts of symbiotic interactions with, with many creatures, particularly insects. They increase the productivity of ecosystems by, by engaging symbiosis below the ground. And that created this incredible literal flourishing of animal sound on the planet. So we, so we owe the, the vibrancy and the diversity of, of sound partly to the evolution of the, of the flowering plants. And the second example of, of sort of historical uh, contingency and factors that, that led to, to diversification is for mammals, the hyoid bone. So if you take your finger and gently do not, uh, we don't want any ER visits right now. Um, run it. You have to extend your throat a bit. Run it back uh, against your throat. You will feel a little bump before you hit your voice box here. That's the hyoid bone. So it's, it's a horseshoe shaped bone up here in your throat. It's the only bone that isn't connected to any other bone. And it's where your tongue is attached. Your voice box hangs down from it on, on ligaments. The back of the throat is dependent on the hyoid bone. Without the hyoid bone, human speech, not possible. The same is true for most other mammals. So when elk are bugling, they, they, they use the hyoid and muscles to move their voice box up and down their throat, all sorts of uh, fancy stuff, coyotes. Uh, use it. The ultrasonic warblings and singings of rats and mice is, is dependent partly on the muscles that are connected down to the hyoid. Why is a hyoid bone in mammals so well developed compared to all our relatives? Reptiles have got a hyoid, but it's a tiny, thin little bone, hardly any muscles attached to it. Well, the hyoid bone first got sophisticated and, and um, complex and with lots of muscular attachments, not for vocalization, but for suckling, for infant mammals to benefit from the, from the great innovation that their, their mothers were providing, which was lactation, milk. And so we have a, the, the uh, evolutionary inventiveness of our great, 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 great grandmothers to thank for the complexity of the hyoid bone and the musculature of, of the mammal mouth and throat that evolution then quickly put to use for, for uses other than suckling uh, as infants to modify the, the sounds that are coming up through, through the trachea. So when I'm speaking now, the, the sounds that you're hearing are contingent on those gifts of the grandmothers, the evolution of flowering plants, and 
the, in, the evolution of insect wings and stridulation back 250 million years ago. And I think it's, it's helpful to acknowledge those complex layers of dependence, uh, both from a point of view of gratitude, uh, to say thank you to the ancestors, but also to understand that modern soundscapes are a convergence of multiple causes and multiple stories from lots and lots of different periods of time. So a modern soundscape is a temporary gathering from the past with multiple different causalities, which is why I think writers like me need to be cautious about using words like symphonies when describing sounds that are created, soundscapes from non-human beings. And I have used that term and other terms like choruses. I already used the word chorus in this talk. Why? Well, generally in, in a symphony or chorus is a single conductor, a single composer, and one species aesthetic is dominating Homo sapiens, usually in a very narrow segment of, of that Homo sapiens, right? So the canon, 90% of the, the rock and roll hall of fame is males. Most of canonical classical music in the Western tradition was produced by males within two or 300 years of one another. So even within the human, uh, canon, we've got this tiny, tiny little range. Instead, a, a soundscape is a multiverse of stories, a generative intersection of radically different causalities and histories. And a key insight as we move forward should be that Earth's diversity was produced by this successive contingent development of one element of the soundscape after another. We listen and speak and sing thanks to many ancestors and we will soon be ancestors ourselves. And so the question, of course, then is what do we want to then catalyze for the future, for the next 50 years or for the next 200 years? I mean, the planet's got maybe two, three billion years left before, before the sun burns it all up. So, so that's part of the ethical question. What do we leave for that, uh, for that second half of Earth history, if you like? So the second example of beginnings that I'd like to discuss concerns the, the beginnings of instrumental music in humans. Of course, instrumental music is one of our great contributions and innovations as a species to the sounds of the world as a tool making species. But note that we're not alone in using tools and in modifying the environment to enhance our bodily sounds. Orangutans blow on leaves uh, to modify their, their voices. Mole crickets shape their burrows. Tree crickets cut out little holes from leaves to, to modify the sound. Cockatoos shape and treasure percussive, in, percussive sticks and things that they use to, to bang on trees. But we humans are especially complex and diverse and inventive. And the first physical evidence we have of instrumental music is from Aurignacian caves about 42,000 years ago in what is now Southern Germany. Of course, it probably wasn't called that back then. So 42,000 years ago is about three times older than the oldest known human agriculture. And I tend to think agriculture is having pretty deep roots. 240 times older than the age of oil wells. Uh, so instrumental music long, long predates many of the things that we think of as particularly characteristic of of Homo sapiens. Now, these instruments from, from the caves are almost certainly not the first musical instruments that were made. Others made of wood probably decayed a year or two after they were made and, and, have, and others haven't been unearthed by, by uh, um, paleontologists or archeologists yet. But the, these are some of the first, uh, um, first examples. And I have a reconstruction of one here. So some, some of these, uh, musical instruments were flute-like uh, instruments made from the hollow wing bones of swans and griffin vultures. Others were carved out of mammoth ivory uh, and then shaped into flutes. And this is one that is made from mammoth ivory. It's a reconstruction, uh, the, uh, a, a reconstruction based on a hypothesis about what the actual length and finger hole spacing would have been for these instruments. This was made by Wolf Hein, who is a uh, archaeological reconstruction expert in Germany who works with uh, samples of, of ivory to recreate in an experimental way some of the tools, the, the art of people who were living 40,000 years ago 
And then Anna Potenkowski, who is a flute player who specializes in interpreting uh, Paleolithic music has played this instrument. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna show you, uh, play you a little sample here. And if afterwards you want to come and uh, check out the, the mammoth ivory reconstruction here uh, that I'm using as, a, uh, uh, as an example in a demonstration, you're welcome to. Are you including drums? Uh, drums, um, so the, actually the first evidence of drum, of, the, of things that we would recognize as a drum. Uh, so there was a, for people on Zoom, there was a question, are drums included? The, 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 the first actual archeological evidence of drums is actually much later than these flutes. However, people in the caves were probably banging on the stalactites and stalagmites, and there's some, some evidence that that was happening. And you know, drumming chimpanzees also use hollow trees as drums. So there's all sorts of percussive sounds, of course, that won't leave any um, any mark in the in the in the records in the caves. So um, here is his uh, Wolf holding the the flute. He used Paleolithic uh, tools to recreate this stone, and it's tied up with an animal sinew and and uh, um, plant pitch. Uh, so, th so this is a reconstruction as uh, would have been uh, made by, by people 42,000 years ago. And so I'm going to play a, a, maybe it's a couple of minutes here of Anna Potenkowski giving voice to this instrument. And I'll note before I play it that she said it's a really hard instrument to play. She needs to be completely relaxed to evoke a sound from this instrument. And the instrument, the, the, the pitch that you hear depends on the embouchure, so the connection between the breath and the lips and the top of the instrument more than the finger holes. And I can vouch for that because I've been trying to play this instrument for a while and, and it's, it's, it's not a pretty thing. So here we go. So what can we learn from this instrument and its, its sounds and its, its materiality? Uh, the first is that it is not, because of the, the pitch depends on embouchure, it is not tied to any one scale. Uh, so, and in fact, some previously published work about these kinds of flutes said that they're on a pentatonic scale or something like that. That's just not, according to uh, Anna Potentowski's work, that's not at all the case. And if you're interested in the particularities of how she evokes the sound from these instruments, she's written a couple of uh, papers with more, with more coming on this. And I think more generally beyond the, the, the particularities of playing that flute, it's important that this instrument emerged from a close relationship between people and the local ecology and materiality of, of their world. The instrument is chimeric. The breath of a hunter flows into part of the body of the prey. And from that emerges music that then joins people together into community. So this is a, this is a pretty powerful kind of interspecies and within species connective tool, one might even say magic, depending on how we, we think of uh, 
that magic because selfhood disappears into interbeing as the breath merges with the body of the other. And so instrumental music is an experience of merger among species. And to this day, even though we hide it uh, mostly, human instrumental artistry merges with the materiality and ecology of the world. Um, but the, as I said, the, the relationship is hidden, partly maybe because that sense of interbeing is so powerful that we need to put on the dark clothes and not mention where things came from and so on to try and contain the magic. But I think in a time of ecological crisis and extinction, now is the time to acknowledge that we are giving second voice to the forest when we play a violin. And particularly the older violins, the 18th and 19th century ones that so many uh, outstanding uh, musicians play these days, particularly uh, stringed instruments, that's the voice of a pre-industrial earth because those trees grew before we started burning oil and mostly before we started burning coal. But even the plastic, I have a, a plastic keyboard at home. I play some, um, some music in quotes uh, on, on that, that, that plastic, where did that, that was made out of oil, which a Mesozoic algae from the bottom of the ocean, it, the, the keyboard is plugged into the, to the mains power supply. And so I'm dependent on uranium or hydropower or other form or burning coal, ancient forests. So even in, in highly synthesized forms of instrumental uh, music making these days or highly synthetic forms, we're in that relationship. And I think acknowledging that both in the, in the form of the music, but also in our rituals and practices around that, I think will be a helpful path for the future. But the flutes also teach us about another relationship. And that is the relationship between the instrument and the space in which it's played. So these instruments are from uh, Holofell's cave. Here's an example, here's a photo from the outside of the cave and the inside is about four times the volume of this space. So extremely reverberant space. When adults walk into this cave, immediately they hush their voices. It's a sense of, wow, we're in this amazing spot. When kids walk in, woohoo, here we go. We're gonna experiment with, with how sound feels in this. And of course we know that flutes sound really good with some reverb. In them. I mean, to this day, even if there isn't reverb, you can add it in afterwards on, on the computer. Whereas a violin solo or something, it would sound horrible in this space. It would just be all garbled. So right from the origin of instrumental music, we have a close relationship between the form of the instrument and the space in which it's played. And that reciprocity between the form of instruments, the space, and the kind of music that is played continues and has continued for tens of thousands of years. Lots of examples from the history of music at one particularly relevant to that are relevant to our culture now. When in the 19th century, uh, music opened up to a more general audience uh, in Western Europe than had previously been the case, big concert halls were constructed. Almost every instrument on the stage was rebuilt, redesigned to give a louder and more stable tone to fit that space. So the sound of a modern flute, the sound of a modern piano is, is in part a product of a 19th century style concert hall. And now we listen to music you know, through earbuds, which creates this very, this space for whispering into someone's ear. And so a lot of singing now it takes a, is whispering. Billie Eilish is amazing at this. You feel she's like right there in your ears, whispering owning that space that we've created. And now we're moving into new forms of listening, like the Maya sound system that can adjust second by second the reverb in a particular space and make sound move around in three dimensions, a new creative tool. And of course, the form of musical instruments and the form of music will then evolve over the coming decades to take advantage of those spatial uh, playback uh, technologies. So this reciprocity is a specific instance within human culture of a more general phenomenon. And that is that communicative sounds bear within them the mark of the environment in which they, in which they uh, are, uh, are produced. So here, here's an example, a bird on the left that sings in dense forest, a summer tanager, a bird on the right that sings in open prairie. In dense forest, you have to sing slow, melodious whistle songs 
so that your sounds don't get garbled by all the reflections from the leaves and the tree trunks and things. Uh, in the open prairie, you can get away with all kinds of stuff because you, you're not going to have that reverb and degradation and smearing. So here's a, 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 a summer tanager. Uh, a sound of, of the forest, and then here's a, a, a lark sparrow from the open prairie uh, from, um, from Colorado. So the sound of bird song therefore contains within it the imprint of the environment in which it is normally sung. We can hear this on the ocean here. Birds that have to deal with crashing waves on rocks have high piercing loud cries, whereas the birds in the same bird families that are inland tend to have much uh, softer calls and tend to be pitched much lower because they don't have to compete with the waves. And I think this complicates the dichotomy that we often draw between so-called biophonic and geophonic sounds because the physical nature, the geo lives within the bio through evolution. They're not such distinct categories. And there's another great example of this uh, right around us here. So these are soil palmettos uh, that are growing all, all around the, the compound here. This plant secretes silicate within it to help it get really tough. What is silicate is rock. And so there's actually rock that has been secreted inside these plants. And when you hear them, particularly in the late afternoon when the sea breezes get going, the soil palmettos rise up in, in, in voice. So again, is that bi biophonic or geophonic? No, it's both because, because they have... Uh, because they've merged. And of course, then with human music, the reverb and the shape of concert halls or earbuds lives within the music that we compose and play and listen to. And so music, whether it's human music or the, the music of the more than human world, reveals the enmeshed relationships of the world where divisions blur and reveal underlying interdependence and interlocked histories, including between the living world and the so-called non-living world. And this is an opportunity for future listening is to bring these unacknowledged connections and dependencies to the surface. Now, the next example of beginnings of sound uh, that I'd like to discuss comes from within. We've listened to some fossils and from the dust of caves and, and the, uh, the signs left in evolutionary trees. But the beginnings of sound live within us as well in human memory. And I'll play this very briefly. This is an important memory for me. Here we have a, the inside of a, a courtyard behind an, a, a, an apartment in Paris. And this is a mer, which is a, um, uh, a common blackbird in, in English. So. A Eurasian blackbird, and it's singing within the reverberant space. And you'll, I think you'll hear that, that gilded tone of the song as the sound reverbs. So that's a sound that takes me right back. So I heard this when I was in my 40s and bam, I was transported back to childhood. I'd not been in Paris. I'd not heard a blackbird in decades. And suddenly that memory, the minute I heard this renting an Airbnb to visit family, I was back. And I asked my mom about it. She says, yeah, when you were three and four, we lived in an apartment and the only bird that sang in the springtime was a blackbird in the courtyard and it reverberated within that. For me, it was as amazing sound as spring. It sounded so beautiful and I remembered it. For her, it was a sad sound because she grew up in a, in a rural area where the blackbird sang with dozens of other species. And here there was just one species left in the, in, in the city, but it lodged deep within me and then reawoke decades later. And this is a specific example of 
the general phenomenon of amazing oral memory within Homo sapiens compared to all of our close relatives. The other great apes are the monkeys that have really good memory for all sorts of cultural connections and visual learning and tactile learning. They have pretty bad acoustic memory. We have really good sonic memory. So, and it might be for a blackbird, but most likely it evolved to help us remember the, sound, the, the sounds of language because of course we're, we're a linguistic species. But that memory then puts us in touch with the, the, the environment around us and allows us to orient us with sort of an internal compass that we carry with us all of our lives. This can take some extreme forms when people move between continents and lose the sound. Like when people move from uh, Western Europe to Australia, for example, there are a number of documented examples of, of, of people, just the sound of the bird song drives them crazy. So they have to move back because each continent has its own acoustic vibe that is tied to the evolutionary history of birds that are much more diverse and much more vigorous on the Australian continent than they are most other places. So other than sort of stories about uh, people fleeing the, uh, their colonial um, uh, departures, I think this makes a, a more important issue about how we develop those oral memories now. And I think one of the things that are really inspiring in this conference for me is to hear how many people are working with young people to, to hone those, those listening abilities and then create memories that can then be told to the future. So I've studied birds and bird populations for decades and read hundreds and well, maybe thousands of papers on them. But the most important piece of information I've ever heard and the most memorable, memorable came from my grandfather. And he told me about the bird song in the Northwest of England, where he grew up in, in sort of a very rural area. And he spent a lot of time outside. And he told me that this is back in the 1970s, that that bird song was almost entirely gone by the 70s and, and things have gotten worse since then. So in a way he inoculated me a little bit about the shifting baseline. He took his sensory experience and he passed it on to me in the context of family. And so that now I have an echo of that, of that listening experience, even though I wasn't alive back in the 1920s, 1930s when, when he was a boy. And so in this age of alienation, from place and from our senses, thinking about uh, new ways to connect back into the past, I think is, uh, is an important task ahead of us. And collectively, we need more such links. I would like to close on a, uh, on a different time scale though, and offer some reflections on sound in the deepest past and in the furthest future that we can imagine. So what were the earliest sounds in the universe and what might they teach us? Well, the earliest sounds in the universe were not the Big Bang. The Big Bang occurred in a space where there was no thing, no space or time, or there was nothing for sound to exist within. So the Big Bang had no bang, it's a misnomer. But after the Big Bang, for the first about 380,000 years, according to the physicists, the Earth, excuse me, the whole universe, existed in this incredibly hot plasma, a, 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 a hot soup of photons and electrons and protons. It was so hot and compressed that no atom could exist. It would immediately just melt into the plasma. And that plasma had acoustic waves flowing through it little pressure waves flowing from one part to another. So those were the, according to the physicists who've studied this, these were the first sound waves in our universe. And as the universe expanded, my hands are going into no thing, you'll observe it, amazing feet. Uh, as the universe expanded, it cooled off enough for atoms to form. Suddenly, all those electrons and photons got, excuse me, the electrons and the protons got together. And the places where the waves were in compression, there were lots of atoms that formed there. And the places in between the rarefactions, there were few atoms. And then gravity got to, where, to work and the places where there were clusters of atoms drew more atoms into themselves. And over millions of years, those became the stars and then the galaxies. 
And to this day, when astronomers measure the distance between galaxies in the sky, they see a wave mark about 500 million years wide, surely the deepest, lowest frequency sound in the whole universe. So these galaxies have a regularity in their spacing that is the quite literally the imprint of the first sound waves in the universe. The cosmic microwave background radiation that flows through us every, every moment is the remnants of, of the photons that escaped that plasma and are still coursing through the universe. They too have that regularity. So the waves are flowing through us, uh, through us every, every moment. So go out and look at the night sky when it's not too, too cloudy and realize that you're seeing ancient sound marked in the universe. And not only are we seeing it, we're made of it, right? Because those stars produce things like solar systems and those solar systems evolved life forms and the atoms in all of our bodies came from those peaks of the pressure waves from the first sound waves. So Carl Sagan said that we're made of star stuff, but we're also made out of ancient sound, which I think is an interesting way of thinking. But, you know, when we engage in soundscape studies, it is sound itself that is studying itself. It's sort of a, it's sort of a curious loop happening. So those are beginnings. But what about the other end of the arc of the universe's story, the distant future? What is sound's ultimate fate? Well, cosmologists disagree about the ultimate fate of the universe, but they all agree that the present state of things will not last. And looking at the political situation, oh, that's a good thing. Okay, either we collapse back into infinitesimal smallness, or we expand out into a cold flatness, or are torn into a thin fog of elementary particles billions of years into the future. All of those outcomes, though, lead to silence. And if all living sound is doomed, and remember the earth is gonna get burned up by the sun long before that ultimate flatness happens, why should we care about the diversity, creativity and diminishment of sound in our environment? I think sound suggests an answer because all sonic experience moves from silence into ephemeral existence and then back into silence. And in this lies the value of sound. The Earth's sounds matter in part because they are ephemeral, not in spite of the fact that they're ephemeral. They're ephemeral manifestations of order and narrative. And there's a parallel here with our own lives, of course, because what is a human life? We pass from non-existence into brief order and, in my case, incoherent narrative uh, back uh, into, into disorder and, and silence, except in the memories of, of those who hold us in memory for a little while. So listening gives us an experience of the value of temporary existence, unlike any other bodily sense. And that thought gives me pause as a sound recordist. What, and I've been recording sounds for, for decades now, but in what way is the act of taking something that has been ephemeral for almost the entire arc of, of the Earth's history and certainly of, of human history and recording it on a wax cylinder or on a, on a digital audio, is taking away, is erasing ephemerality? Does that have ethical, moral, artistic implications? And I think it does. I think the implications are not clear. I'm not arguing that we should stop recording things, but I do question more and more the value of these recordings as opposed to promoting experiences of ephemeral live sound in the moment that is then gone and lives in memory for a little while, but then is completely gone. And, and I think that's one uh, thing that musicians often understand uh, very well because they, they're feeding on the energy from their audiences. Now, sound has one other value and that is sound is generative because sound connects one being to another. Sound seeded the stars. It causes, causes voices to live, to lift up from primordial oceans and from insect wings and it created animal music and language and human music and language within that. So sound has value because it is also generative. The old school story of biology was that life is very atomistic. The fundamental unit of life, are individual cells, individual genes, organisms, species. We now understand that from within uh, science 
what the wisdom traditions have been teaching all along is that, that life and existence is all relational that uh, a self is just a temporary manifestation of, of, the, of the reality that relationship and interconnection is a fundamental uh, generative force in the universe and the fundamental force certainly within biology and, and beyond. So that's why the sounds are so diverse and glorious and listening is so important. We hear not only the result of creation, here I'm, this is not by the gods, it's by the gods of biology and physics, but the very act of creation, we inhabit by listening the generative power of the universe expressed in the particularity and the ephemerality of the moment. And I thank you for your attention. And I would be to like to take any questions, if there's time, questions, comments, refutations. Uh, yes, how much of my, the question is how much of my educational work has been directed to musicians and outside of the sciences. So as a teacher, I work with undergraduates and I'm mostly, well, the first 15 years I worked mostly with science majors. Now I work more with uh, anthropology students uh, and creative writing students. So not so much musicians, but writers and taking writers outside and asking them to listen, but also to smell and engage with other, with other senses. I think, um, one of the hesitations I have, say, about the idea of acoustic ecology is it divides hearing from everything else. Well, hearing is also proprioception, and hearing depends on what we're tasting, and what we're tasting depends on sound. So, so the idea that the senses are, are divided into these neat little categories, I think, is, is problematic and, and just untrue. Uh, so my invitation to the writing students is to awaken to their bodies and then have some material to write about, because I'm... I want to read some interesting stuff it's out of self-interest. And also, that's your superpower as a writer, but also I think as, as an other creative, is to pay attention in the moment that then is a stimulus for curiosity and gives you something to share and to connect with, rather than just feeding on your own cleverness, which is often enormous, right? Particularly in young people, there's all sorts of amazing ideas burning away. Let's connect that swirl of ideas and energy to other swirls of ideas and energy. And, and for, for whole organisms like us, sensory connection is the way. My hope for this book actually is to reach out partly into the community of musicians, composers, and appreciators of music. I mean, I think we're all musicians. Where if, if As human beings, that's part of our inheritance. Uh, to try and ask the question, where does human music fit within the larger diversity of sound within the world? You know, I have my take on that, and it's essentially a series of riffs on that. It's not a, comp a comprehensive treatise or set of theses ab about that. But I'm hoping the ideas in the book are, are stimulating and generative for, for, for that community. I mean, I should say that working with musicians, I mean, I've gotten more out of the relationship, I think, than they have, is hearing how they relate to the materiality of their instruments, uh, what it means to play for a live audience rather than a microphone. All of these are think conversations that are really shifted how I think about my own work and my relationship to music. More and more I'm hungering for, I want to hear the live performance and then it's gone and I will forget about it because um, I forget half of things that happen. And ultimately, you know, we're all going, rather than obsessing about getting all the CDs or the downloads and, and not that there's anything wrong with recorded uh, music, but I do think maybe it's partly a product of lockdown as well, this hungry for, hunger for lived experience. And as a teacher, this idea of getting outside of the walls, which are literally designed to wall out the modern human world and opening the senses out there. I mean, this is a bit I skipped over in the talk that architecture, of course, is a, is a sort of embodiment of, of philosophy, of epistemology and ethics. And architecture is mostly raising the middle finger to every other species on this planet. I mean, there's some nice exceptions right here on this campus, some beautiful spaces that open it up to the, to the outside. And getting students out in the rain and all the rest of it is, is really important. Uh, yeah, the question is about auditory memory in, in Homo sapiens and where that came about. So what we know from the neurobiology of this is that the, the connections between the brain areas for producing sound, 
for hearing sound and for interpreting it are particularly strong in humans. They're also particularly strong in birds, perhaps not surprisingly, because there are cousins in vocal, in vocal production and prowess. Uh, compared to those same, re the same regions are present in say chimpanzees or other closely related species, but the connections are, are not there. And if, I'm not a neurobiologist, but it, but it seems that the, the current understanding is that the connectivity is what gives us that power to connect emotion to not just listening, but the production of sound, because production and listening are, are deeply connected neuro, neuro, neurobiologically, not just in humans, but in, but in other species. So that needs, that's part of the sort of magic trick that evolution did within our brains to produce that. And it really is an extraordinary thing as someone who grew up in a country with a different language than here and to hear words that I haven't heard in 50 years and instantly just know what they mean and their context. And, it, it, and I, I don't think of myself as having a good memory at all. And yet it's there. So whereas my pet cat, you know, I like to think that it can remember all the sweet nothings that I've, I've, I've whispered into, into uh, their ear, but, but no. Of course, other species have, and it could, for lots of other good reasons, but no, other species have their own amazing memories. I mean, birds can have a spatial memory that knocks out, is out of the ballpark. Um, the tactile and... Um, social memory of close relatives like uh, the, the other great apes is really huge. So I'm not arguing for sort of human superiority overall. I'm just saying we have this one character that, that is, I mean, as people who study soundscape ecology, they put, without those connections, it probably the field wouldn't exist, right? Because we, we'd hear stuff, we'd forget it. And they're like, whatever, we're not going to theorize about stuff we can't remember. Um, yeah, so... The structures of academia emerge from the, the evolutionary history and ecology of our own species as, as they should. Yes, please. Yes. So the question is about how do we have a future that's more open-minded sonically and not stuck within old ways of listening, particularly as they're shaped and constrained by linguistic and musical patterns. Um, I think there are two questions. And, and the, for me, the easier question is, how do we then talk about it? Uh, you know, as a writer, I think a lot about words. And I do think that using words that are directly derived from human music, like a fugue or a symphony, or even a, a song is potentially also uh, problematic, even though it's on the title of one of my books. Uh, because it comes with a whole set of baggage that constrains the human imagination. And it also fails to acknowledge, particularly, for example, when we're describing the soundscape of a forest, there's an, an, an anarchic quality of the soundscape of a forest that there are thousands of different species aesthetics and sound production and listening mechanisms all at play, some of them cooperating, some competing, some completely ignoring one another, but there's no central controlling hierarchy the way there is in almost all human ways of, sonic, of communicating sonically. I mean, within language, we have a, a hierarchy so that we can be understood one to another. And I'm not saying those are bad things. And within music, there are patterns and hierarchies so that the, the music sounds good to us and, and moves us. So being careful about language, how we describe sounds, I think is, is, uh, was my main point there. In terms of listening, I don't think we can break out of the human modes of listening, except by, we can't break out, but we can expand the boundaries. And I think repeated practice for me personally has been the key. Going back to the same place again and again, and, and as an act of meditation, my mind wanders, I just bring it back to the soundscape. My mind wanders again, I bring it back to live embodied attention in the moment. And then I hear the, the, the rhythms and the pacings and the timbers that weren't present to me before. And there can be a fruitful conversation between that and my mind and, oh, you know, that, that's a really nice groove, it's kind of bluesy, or there's something here from... Uh, from my piano practice that I'm really I'm hearing out here in the forest. But more often I'm hearing alien 
rhythms and pacings and scales and so on, which is refreshing. To, to, it's like reading fiction written by somebody who has a completely different mindset from you. You break out of your own consciousness, at least partially for a little while. And you can get that by, I mean, listening to a cicada, you're really breaking out of your consciousness because cicada world is, is so, so different from ours. So I think acknowledging the fact that, that we have constraints, biases, we have sensory biases, of course, we can't hear beyond certain ranges without technological enhancements. Um, but through repeated meditative practice, pushing beyond that. The other thing, and I, I think working in community and in conversation with others really helps. When my students tell me, hey, don't talk about the tree that way, or did you hear this? Or I you know, stuck my hand in the water and was just listening to the stream through my hand. Just those little experiments that they do, maybe they're major experiments, help me then grow. And if I've just got my own practice, that's great. But my own practice in conversation with others is, is, is very fruitful. Uh, and of course, finding those others is, is one of the purposes of, of conferences like, like this. So. Yes, yeah, so, so the question and comment was about making sure we include neurodiversity, things that are quote unquote mental illness, uh, people who are living within those, those worlds as part, of the com as part of the conversation. And I discussed that very briefly in my, I mean, my own experience with uh, anxiety, which can be, uh, can completely shut me down sometimes. And the soundscape really affects that. And then I find, a, how do I negotiate my way through that to, for example, tap the great energy and vibrancy of cities without getting destroyed by it is a challenge. And I have, I have my own practices of how do I transition from forest listening to going to New York and then leaving New York to go back into the woods. There are little rituals that I do. And so that's a very small example of that that I know say other people in my family don't, don't really know like, what the hell are you doing? But it, it helps me get the sensory modality ready and uh, tuned to in the right way that, that in a way is protective, but not so protective as, as that I'm blocking out the rest of, of the opportunities in the world in ways that would starve me. Well, thank you all for your attention. I'd be delighted to continue the conversation later.